Hello YouTube, and welcome to a brand new series on this channel, in which I will be debunking the most common trading myths that you can hear on YouTube Fitness. The goal of this series is going to be to dispel certain notions that might be stuck in your head that prevent you from getting the results that you want, starting today with the abs. So I think that most everyone wants a six pack, uh, there are some deviants out there that don't care about it. But in terms of aesthetic, it's extremely important to have a defined core. And yet there's a lot of confusion around that muscle group in particular, to the point that you even hear certain types of advice that I believe to be so stupid that it's shocking that to this day they are still peddled, even though we know for a fact that they are nonsense. So let's start with the one that I think is the most grievous and the most pernicious. One that I'm certain that you've heard at least once in your life, and that is that abs are made in the kitchen. The notion behind this statement is the idea that, hey, if you want a six pack, there's no point in training the abs, you should just get super lean and you'll see them. This is very pernicious because I know many natural bodybuilders who think exactly like this. They never train their abs and whenever they want to see their abs, they cut down to very low body fat to reveal them. But you understand, following this logic, that there is a big problem with this. If you reveal the abs, doesn't that also mean you could build them in the first place? Which also means that once they are revealed, they are much bigger. That should make sense. But for some people, for some reason, it doesn't. So what I would like you to do is this. Instead of thinking about abs, think about any other muscle group. If someone told you, hey, to get better biceps, just get super lean so that you can see the insertions and the entire muscle, you would laugh in the guy's face. Because you know that to get better biceps, you have to grow the biceps. The same goes for the abs. The muscle group of the abs is a muscle group like the rest of the body. So treat it as such. But if you never train the abs and you always rely on being lean to see them, well, they're surely never going to develop that way. But it's also true the other way around, meaning that I also know people when they bulk who say, well, now I can't see my abs at all. So clearly working them is a waste of time. As if a muscle that is invisible under the fat cannot hypertrophy. If anything, it's the other way around. A bulk is the moment where you should be training your abs because then once you cut back, the abs are going to be revealed much, much faster. So many people have to cut down to tremendously low body fats to see their abs. That's not a leanness problem. It's a muscularity problem. All of this could be simply fixed if the muscle group in particular was trained. And it also coincidentally, leads to people trying to stay lean all the time. Because if you don't train your abs and you only reveal them, you make them in the kitchen, well, then this also means that if you want to keep seeing them, you're going to have to stay lean. How many people have told me or asked me, hey, NH, how do you get a six pack year round? How do you maintain this? I thought it was impossible for naturals. And yeah, it's impossible if you don't train them. But if you do, just like any other muscle group, it'll be there. It's not going to go anywhere. It's muscularity. Muscularity cannot vanish, but leanness can, especially if you want at some point to put on pounds so as to put on muscles. But if you don't, you'll be one of these skinny guys who clings to their six pack all the time because they think that they have to make a choice between being a pig with a belly or a skinny dude with a six pack. I'm there to tell you that there is a middle ground and that middle ground is called actually training the muscle group. But this goes beyond than just abs because this is also a very prevalent myth in bodybuilding in general. You still have people who will tell you that diet is 80%. That's nonsense. Training is 80%. Training is even more than 80%. Muscle is made via training. The fuel afterwards, what you eat or what you don't eat, that's just the way to shape the body around the work that you do. But without the work, all of that is for nothing. And that leads us to the second portions of myths that I want to debunk today. And that is how to get abs. Once you've accepted the idea that they're not made in the kitchen, they're made in the gym. What are you supposed to do in the gym? Well, what you should not be doing is relying on compound movements. Again, by a show of hands, how many of you have heard, oh, you want a six pack, you want abs? Just do compounds, bracing is enough for abs. That is absolutely untrue, but it's still a very prevalent myth on YouTube fitness. And this comes from a confusion between core strength and abdominal size. The two are not the same because once again, strength doesn't equal size. 
You could be someone who has a very strong core and you can override press or squat a ton of weight with a rigid spine and have no abs whatsoever. On the flip side, you could be someone with a pretty six pack and if I put 200 pounds on your back, you're going to fold like a pretzel. Why? Because the two are separated. And yeah, there's going to be some correlation here, but if you want a six pack in particular, you cannot rely on core training to get there. You have to do more. And what is that more? Well, it's what you would do for any other muscle group. Train it with a stretch, with a positive and a negative. If you only do count pounds, like the squat or the deadlift, the only thing that occurs is a bracing. It's an isometric contraction of the abdominal muscles. That's it. You don't get the stretching component. Once again, let's bring it back to another muscle. If I told you that if you want to grow your biceps, you can just squeeze them, you can just contract them or do a static hold, would you then believe me? Would you follow that advice? I think that most of you would tell me that this is nonsense and you need a range of motion and a stretch to get the maximum hypertrophy benefit that you can get. And I would agree with you. So apply the same logic for the abs. It's not enough just to brace. You also have to stretch, do your sit-ups, do your windshield wipers. This is what gets people six-packs. Look at all of these armchair experts who tell you to just do the main lifts, the compound, and then check if they have a six-pack. For the most part, they won't. On the other hand, you have a ton of pretty boys who don't do compounds at all, which I do not condone, but at least they have something to show for it, which is the abs. Why? They do ab isolation all the time. So learn from that lesson and do both. Do your compounds and then do the isolation to grow the abs in particular. And the other reason why, even if it did give you results, you wouldn't want to rely on compound movements for abs is because they have a horrible stimulus to fatigue ratio. You know that term is thrown around a ton, but I've never heard it actually used to explain why using the bracing for abs is a bad idea. Let's say you want to train abs on a given day. You're going to do a set of deadlifts or a set of squats, but that is going to tax you so much more than if you just did isolation for the abs. So most of the time what you'll end up doing is you'll skip isol ab isolation, you'll do your squats and deadlifts, and you'll tell yourself, hey, that took care of the ab portion. You know it's bullshit, but many people lie to themselves. It's just like people who do deadlifts and they say, oh, I'm good for forearms. No, you're not. You're supposed to isolate the forearms as well. But since these people have those so-called jokes where they tell themselves, oh, it's all we need, they never actually wake up to the reality. And the reality is that just like any other muscle group, you have to train your abs and you have to train them as a priority in isolation. Then once that step is taken, we face another wall, another batch of myths. These are also ones that I'm certain you heard. For example, the fact that sit-ups or ab training in general is bad for the back. I think that this is a myth that is so ingrained in the common population normies that they don't even think or understand where it's coming from. They just regurgitate it. But it makes no sense. It's true that if you lead with the torso and you flex the lower back and you try to reach with the torso instead of actually using the flex and the bend at the hips to engage the abdominals, you might get some problems in your lower back. But if you do the work properly and you do sit-ups the way they're supposed to be done, there should be no problem whatsoever. The function of the ab is also to move the trunk. It's to stabilize the trunk. So at no point is using the function of the ab going to lead to degeneration in your spine. If that does happen, it means that your form is not proper and that's that. But just saying this, I think, opened another kind of forms and that is the function of the abs in particular. Because you are also here on the other side, usually from bodybuilders, that certain exercises don't train the abs at all because it's not the main function of the movement. For example, leg raises. I know people that I respect that based on biomechanic data tell people that it's useless to do leg raises because what works when you do leg raises is the musculature of the hips and the legs and not really the abs. And technically, they're not wrong, but what they fail to take into account is that the abs, for the most part, have a passive role in most of the motions of the torso. So what ends up happening when you do your leg raises is that once you extend the legs back, what catches the weight of the glutes, the pelvis, and the legs is the abs and absolutely nothing else. And when you reverse back, the stretch and the contraction occurs, and the abs work as well. So yes, they have a secondary role. They are not the ones initiating the motion, but just like with sit-ups, they are certainly the one carrying the torso through the motion, which is exactly what we want. 
And all of that is du jargon, it's giga brain talk. I can just tell you that, for me, what made the biggest difference for my low abs in particular is leg raises. And anyone who's done leg raises would tell you that, yeah, you feel that portion of the abs stretch contract to catch the weight. It's the difference between theory and being an armchair specialist and being someone who's in the trenches. Guarantee you that all of these calisthenic guys who have perfect six packs don't give a fuck if certain studies prove that via EMG data, the abs are not engaged on leg raises. They spam leg raises, they get a six pack and they don't care about anything else. I think you should take a page out of their book and just do it. Just train your abs. You will see the results guaranteed. And you should not, I repeat, you should not worry about it thickening the waist. That's another myth and it's the final myth of this video I'm going to be debunking. It also comes from bodybuilders who are obsessed with having a V taper and a very small and narrow waist. For the most part, waist size is genetic. It's predetermined by your bone structure. After this, yes, you can store some fat around the waist in the form of low endos, in the form of, of subcutaneous fat, in the form of visceral fat even that thickens up the waist. But you will never ever ruin your perfect physique by getting bigger and a more defined core. That will not happen. Even the obliques that I hear some people say, oh, never train your obliques. Why? For the most part, you will find that the bodybuilders with too big of obliques already had big obliques before, but before they were flabby and then they turned into muscle via work. It was the same for me. I've always had a big waist. Now it looks much better because there's muscle on it. Between no muscle and muscle, with the same thickness, I think that there is really no reason why you shouldn't work that part of the body in particular. And if you do notice some thickening, guess what? It's muscle tissue. It means that if you stop using the movements that thicken the waist, it will go back down. But at the end of the day, all of that, again, is a myth propagated by pro bodybuilders who end up with a pregnant belly, not because they train core abs, but because they take drugs. If you're natural, you will not have that problem. And that sums up this video. These were all of the myths that I wanted to debunk today so that you stop following such stupidity and you focus on what really matters. Bottom line is, there is no secret to trap training. It's not made in the kitchen, you have to train them and you have to use the proper exercises. But once you're there, what is left is patience and consistency. Isolate your abs for every week of every month of every year and you'll get a six pack. There is absolutely no way around that. And if you want to see proper execution of the seed up of the other exercises, Check out the description. I have actually made a full guide on how to get a six pack and it's available for you. I'm going to leave you with that. As you might have noticed, I was not super active in the past 10 days. It's because I'm working on a few big projects for you guys that are going to come out in the following months. I'm working on bringing back some of the series that you guys love so much that have been on hiatus for the past few months. I have a big two hour podcast coming out this Wednesday on another channel. And then there is the forum tier list waiting for you guys on Sunday. It's a biggie. It's an hour long and I'm making sure it is pristine for you guys. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.